All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Melbourne or good day from whatever time it is where you are. My name is Kathleen Gray uh, from the Centre for Digital Transformation of Health at the University of Melbourne. And thanks for joining our seminar series today. We've put up the flyer for um, our current seminar series and we'll just give you a minute or two to absorb what we've done and what's coming up. Of course, what we have done is recorded and available on our YouTube channel if you've missed something that we've done already. We'll just give it a few more minutes for a few more participants to join us and then we'll kick off. Alrighty, well, I think um, we'll get started now. And uh, as is customary, we will start by acknowledging that we are on the lands here in Melbourne of the Wurundjeri people who have been the indigenous custodians of this land for thousands of years. And we wish to acknowledge that and to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And please take a moment in your own thoughts to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples whose land you're working on today. Um, now I am tag teaming with my colleague at the Center for Digital Transformation of Health who's working the chat room. Um, so please keep an eye on the chat room. I'd like to just make a note about some housekeeping first before I introduce our speakers. Please make sure that your audio is muted during the presentation and please use the chat window for preference for your questions so that we can prioritize them. Uh, if we're missing you, put your hand up in um, your video window and we'll keep an eye out for your question then. Um, if you're on Twitter, don't forget to tag us at mhix-um. So today we're really thrilled to welcome two speakers from the University of Michigan Schools of Medicine and Public Health. Gretchen Piat is an assistant professor of learning health sciences and Health Behavior and Health Education. And Karen Stahlberg is Associate Professor of Learning Health Sciences and Obstetrics and Gynecology. Uh, we're going to ask them to share their screen and tell us about a really cool postgraduate degree program that they are offering there. We are in the process of rethinking what Australia needs by way of postgraduate education. And when we became aware of what these ladies are doing at the University of Michigan, we really thought we must hear from you. So thanks, Karen and Gretchen. We're really looking forward to what you've got to tell us about the story of your degree program. Well, thank you, Kathleen. And I'd, I'd just like to thank you and thank Wendy and everyone at the Center for Digital Transformation for Health for inviting Karen and I to share this information with you today. Um, and, you know, like you said, talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing in graduate education in learning health systems at the University of Michigan. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides with everyone. And hopefully this will go well. Looks great. 
Let's see, I think I need to get it into presenter view, which would help everybody. Was it in presenter view before? Um, we could see your notes as well as the full screen. Want to try that again? Mm. We're seeing your first slide and your name. That's perfect. There we are. Perfect. Okay. Let me just see. <clears throat> we okay. are actually seeing your voice transcription as well, but I don't know that that's a problem. Yeah, I think that was that's set up mm -hmm. on um, a lot of our machines yeah, to for, just for make sure people. just make sure that every, yeah everyone is is able to get the content. So we have a lot to talk about today, um, but I want you to come away from this session by um, you know hearing about a review of what the concept of the learning health system is. Uh, we want to describe how and why the health infrastructures and learning systems and the health, Hills Online programs were developed. Um, we want to describe the approach used to build the Hills curriculum. So when I say Hills, that stands for Health Infrastructures and Learning Systems. Uh, we're going to highlight Hills Online and the processes, processes we used to build the online degree program. So as many of you know, uh, learning health systems are organizations or networks which tend to continuously self-study and adapt using both data and analytics to generate knowledge, engage stakeholders, and then ultimately implement behavior change in order to transform practice. And, you know, learning health systems, they were designed to solve the tough problems that we so often face in healthcare systems. And these, these problems, whether they're acute or whether they're chronic, they need, the, they're system problems and they need system solutions. And, you know, we tend to think of the, the system problems as not so much about the people um, that work in the health system. It's about how they're working together. And it's about the environment in which they're working together. And these acute and chronic problems that the learning health system addresses, most often they're problems that take a really, really long time for a solution to come about. Um, and there's actually, you know, there's evidence out there that shows us that from, from the bench to the bedside to practice, it takes about 17 years in total. And the learning health system was developed in order to allow that 17 years to be decreased to maybe 17 months or 17 days or even down to 17 minutes. Um, so that's, that is in general what we think about when we think of the learning health system. And so what does, what does a learning health system do? So we, we tend to really like this image in our department. We refer to this as the uh, learning health cycle. And we like it because it's very cyclical, as you can see. And it's not only cyclical, but it's continuous. And you get continuous um, movement in order to create continuous learning around that cycle. So I want to take just a little bit of time uh, to describe the learning health cycle in a little bit more detail because I know some of you may not have seen this before. And it's, it's an important piece of our educational programs uh, because we actually took this learning health cycle and developed our curriculum around it. So let's see, here's my mouse, my pointer down here. So the learning health cycle tends to start with the formation of a learning community. And when we talk about a learning community, this is 
these are who we think of as stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders who are interested in this health problem of interest. And like I said, this health problem can be an acute issue. It could be a chronic health problem. I myself do diabetes research. Um, so in my mind and in the work that I do, diabetes is always at the center. Um, but it starts with this formation of the learning community. And these stakeholders are folks who one, have a vested interest in that health problem, and two, they have enough clout, I would say, to really be able to be invested in the, in the um, figuring out what the solution is to that health problem. So as, as the learning community embarks on this performance to data or green arrow um, section of the cycle, they're really using the data that they have to figure out um, what's happening, what's happening in the system with these health problems. Um, so this could be this could be data that you know reports from the hospital or um, perhaps other you know state level reports to to see where things stand right now. And as we transfer in to the blue arrow or the data to knowledge arrow. This is where we take all of that data and we start to analyze it. And this is the part of the cycle where we really rely heavily on things like predictive analytics, on natural language processing, um, on you know, even qualitative analyses. We do a lot of qualitative analyses in our department as well. And we're generating knowledge and generating knowledge. And at this point, we also start to bring in some external evidence into our, into our cycle and, and start to combine the analyses that we're doing and combining that with the external evidence that's out there already. So those could be guidelines, um, they could be standards, they could, they could be the existing uh, literature in this area. And that's when we transition, when we transition into the red part of the cycle or the implement part. And so now we're equipped with this, with this knowledge and we need to figure out a way to implement it into practice. And this is the part of the cycle where we are very, very heavy on things like knowledge representation and management, um, health infrastructures and last but certainly not least because it's my area uh, implementation science um, where we are actually implementing um, what we've created into practice in order to improve care so as you could tell the learning health system is very unique and it's also um, pretty tricky to figure out and to understand and you know to to really um sort of dig into to be able to influence change and influence improvement so we really do have this need for a very uniquely trained lhs workforce and the problems are unique and therefore we need a uniquely trained workforce so we need folks who are you know, they have the skills that are needed to address both the social and the technical challenges of making these continuous improvements routine. So if you think back to the, to the cycle, you know, on the one side, you have all of the more analytical pieces, the data pieces, the analysis pieces. Um, on the other side, you have more of the social pieces. Um, so people who have the skills in both of those is really really important um, you know we're we're looking to train our students in uh, health policy data sciences learning and implementation sciences health informatics and complex systems and the list goes beyond this as well so what is hills and why is it unique so the health infrastructures and learning systems degree or degrees they address the social and technical challenges uh, systems face in making continuous health improvement routine. And I will say that we're the first grad program uh, of our kind 
in the United States. I do think that others will eventually get on board. Um, there are, we have some colleagues at Vanderbilt who um, I would say are probably the next uh, group to maybe come up with, a, with a, this type of degree. As I mentioned, we have a joint emphasis on information and social science. And students in the program design, implement, and evaluate innovative change and continuous improvement. And I would really like to just talk a bit about how transdisciplinary the degree really is. Uh, you know, we have people coming to us um, wanting a Hills degree, either a master's or a PhD. Um, they, they're coming from the health professions, you know, we've had physicians, we've had uh, nurse practitioners, we've had uh, rehabilitation therapists, uh, we, we have students with backgrounds in engineering, we have uh, people with backgrounds in public health, in project management, we have a, a nice cohort of, of folks who come with a background in informatics. The one thing, though, that I think I'm most proud of and that I tend to hang my hat on a little bit is that, you know, I talk to a lot of students and um, a, lot of, a lot of students are sort of weighing, do I want a degree in public health or do I want a degree in informatics or do I want this strange hills, you know, type degree? Um, and I tell them, you know, I have my, my own background is in public health. And I tell them, if you are interested in, in improving the health of populations of people, I would highly encourage you to get a degree in public health. And I, I would never say anything different. But if you are interested in changing the health system and improving the processes that are inherent in, in the health system and making health systems better, you should, oh, I'm sorry, you should spend your time with us. Um, because in Hills, we train you to change the system. So back in 2015 was when we came up with the idea that, hey, there's this learning health systems field, it's really unique um, and we would be so remiss if we didn't create a curriculum and a degree program uh, to train people. So we really took what we knew about the learning health cycle, what we knew about learning health systems, and we developed a curriculum that is quite innovative and it is actually intertwined with the learning health cycle. So you could see here, that again, uh, if you think back to the previous learning health cycle slide, uh, this side was, it said analyze right here. So this is where our more uh, research methods and analytical um, courses lie. On the red side, this was the implement side. So this is where courses in health infrastructures, implementation science, knowledge representation and management, that's where they lie. And then down here in the performance to data side of the cycle, that's where we teach our ethics and policy courses or course. Um, so I wanna, I know this is, sometimes it's a bit weird to look at this. It kind of looks like a Hydra. Um, so I wanna just put up a good old fashioned table <laughs> so, that, so that you can get an idea of the courses that we offer in the program. And these courses are, um, they're color coded there, as you could see based on the cycle. So again, um, you know, we offer a, a series in health infrastructures. We offer a series in implementation science. Um, we offer, you know, in the blue here, um, uh, a good bit of analytics courses, uh, methods courses, evaluation courses. Um, and then we do offer the, um, the one uh, policy and ethics course as part of the core curriculum. Um, we also offer electives, as you can see down here, and these are just the ones that we offer in the department, but our students tend to take um, uh, advanced um, 
methods courses that are very analytical and you know would get them to the to where they need to be to analyze pretty complex data health systems type of data um, that are often hierarchical in nature uh, so we have a lot of students who take those courses and then the other electives that they take really are based on their own individual interests and usually for phd students what their dissertations will be based in So we have three degree options. So we have a residential PhD program, we have a residential master's, and we have a new online master's degree. Uh, in the residential PhD, you know, it's a 36 credit hour degree program uh, that everyone completes a learning cycle project, which is sort of like a practicum um, after the first year uh, in the program. For the PhD program, we, we have a qualifying exam. Uh, students achieve candidacy after they complete a literature review. And then they have the, the very typical uh, prospectus defense and then their final defense. For the master's degree, uh, what's really nice is that for the, res for the residential masters and the online masters, it's the same courses. It's the same um, requirements. It's 27 credit hours. Uh, again, everyone completes that learning cycle project, which is done uh, after the first year. And both the residential masters and the online masters can be completed in 12 months if someone is full time. Now, most of our master's students choose not to be full time. Um, so then they're, you're looking at around a 20 month uh, time to degree for the master's programs. So at this point in the presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Karen Stahlberg. Uh, Karen is the director of the online master's degree and has been essential in, in its development. So I'm going to go ahead and um, change slides and Karen's on video and I will be quiet. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Gretchen. Not that you're going to be quiet, but thank you for handing it over. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, we still are here in yesterday land uh, with the sun setting in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which you see in uh, the background for Gretchen. Um, uh, just a quick background for me. I uh, grew up as an OBGYN and then got the education bug and went back and got a master's in higher education. So um, through that journey, I ended up creating uh, some online courses. Some uh, may be familiar with my Coursera course, which is Instructional Methods in Health Professions Education, which is where I uh, kind of gathered all the information for uh, how do we put this online? So uh, if you could move one forward for me, Gretchen, that'd be awesome. Thanks so much. So, you know, the first question is, well, you had your PhD program, you have a residential program, why would you go ahead and do something online? And certainly, why would you do it asynchronously? Well, what we discovered in the first few years of the program is, especially for master's students, what they really wanted was to be able to stay in their work environment, because they were coming from uh, uh, health care uh, workforce, they were coming either from, uh, you know, um, they were practitioners, they were also uh, uh, folks who were administrators in the system. Uh, there were some individuals who actually did all of the data support. And so they wanted to be able to work and advance their information and knowledge. And what we realized was, well, a good way to do that would be to create an online program so that people could stay where they were, use their local environment and their work that they're doing to inform their ability to learn these new skills and processes. Um, we decided asynchronous for pretty much the same reason, which is uh, between time zones and uh, time with family or time at work, uh, people can't necessarily always be in class on Tuesdays from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. So that, that's sort of how we came up with that overall structure. Next slide, please, Gretchen. So um, 
the thing to remember is that we started out thinking about PhD learners as well as master's students. Uh, and master's students are a little bit different than PhD students. So I have a master's in higher education after getting an advanced degree. And so I think we're a little wiser uh, because we don't spend all that time with dissertations, et cetera. <laughs> we, learn, we learn the necessities. But what we're hoping is that our learners who get master's degrees will, um, I know, I knew Gretchen was going to pop in there. Um, she's the real doctor. I'm just a fake one. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, so we, anticipate that people will become leaders in learning healthcare uh, systems, that they'll be innovators and improvers. We view our graduates as people who will have expertise in process quality, data development, or combinations thereof, right? Because each informs the other. And so uh, much like we think about interprofessional education and teams, uh, if you know and are familiar with other people's roles and responsibilities, or what their expertise is, it's easier to work together as a team. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I was charged with thinking about is, okay, so you wanna build it and you wanna build it online. Well, um, I tend to use the backwards design uh, principles, which means I'm thinking about the end in mind and then building backwards to meet those intended outcomes. Uh, so the first thing we wanted to think about was what type of learning management system do you need to create an entire online degree program. We um, looked at a bunch of options and we settled for a, a learning management system called Canvas that is prominent in the University of Michigan setting, uh, can be web based so that people can access it. Uh, from a variety of places and spaces, uh, and it's firewalled. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we had security and uh, support for uh, distance learning, and, and we decided to use the structures that were already in, in existence in the university. Um, the other thing that we wanted to think about were the types of pedagogies, right? And so while right now I'm sort of a talking head, which is that figure all the way on the right, that's actually not the best way to do online learning. Uh, as you know, sitting at the end of a Zoom meeting like this all the time, um, while it's great for multitasking, it's not necessarily great for uh, active engagement, for small group discussions, unless we break out into small groups, right? And if we're going to be asynchronous, then how are we gonna support that um, discussion, that engagement, the exchange of ideas, uh, you, you get the picture. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna geek out for just another moment because when we think about online learning, uh, this actually is really um, sort of my go-to, which is Mayer's principles. So this is based in cognitive science. On the left side in the red boxes, you see uh, the different types of cognitive processing that is going on while we're watching multimedia. Uh, I am old enough to, to admit that Sesame Street came on board uh, right when I was growing up. And Sesame Street actually was built on cognitive science from the Children's Television Network. And it's amazing what they did in terms of signaling, making sure that um, you know, today is brought to you by the letter A, and then they use A throughout the program. So there's contiguity or, or continuity through the uh, entire program. They sing, right? Lots of songs. I'm quite certain you can remember some of those songs. Again, to help um, use different components in your cognitive neural networks to make things stick. So we talk about coherence principles, signaling, redundancy, saying it over and over again, right? Uh, segmenting. So that's really important. Uh, we know that, you know, um, here in the United States, you can, the, our phone numbers are seven digits because in general, that's sort of the length of what you can remember unless you uh, memorize pi, which is a totally different scary thing. Um, but uh, segmenting into eight minute quick hit videos and then reinforcing the information that you've uh, given people 
or asking people to take a quick uh, quiz to help uh, solidify the knowledge that you just presented. Uh, personalization. So I am purposefully, I'm gonna uh, sort of give you a meta moment and uncover my pedagogy, right? I am purposefully looking at the camera. You probably can't tell, but I'm literally looking at a wall and my camera. I'm very conversational in the way I'm speaking so that you feel like you can come right in and have a discussion with me and that I'm speaking to you directly. So part of the, the challenge is that, how are you, you can go move forward for me, Gretchen, thanks, no worries. I thought you were signaling me to keep on moving. Um, so part of the uh, challenge is, as you can imagine, if you're thinking about the technology to teach, the pedagogies to teach, the cognitive principles involved, you really want expert partners. And so we have had the benefit of working with our Center for Academic Innovation here at the University of Michigan, and we're able to partner with a learning experience design firm called iDesign, I have to give them credit. Uh, but the, the project is really about front-loading everything. So the, the um, opportunity to change your slides right before lecture doesn't happen in an online environment. All of this is really planned out and purposefully constructed so that when you hit the run button, it runs. But it's an iterative process and you can see these cycles of, of you know, what are we trying to do? Uh, what are, what is the problem we're trying to solve? How do we ideate and curate the content for our lectures for the um, problem sets that we want our learners to engage in? How do we create asynchronous discussion forums so that people can actually uh, talk with one another and create a meaningful connection, even though they're online? And so once you run it, then you develop it and learn from it. Right? You always want to do continuous improvement. Um, hopefully you've seen uh, the, the cycle again, right? which is to say performance of data, data to knowledge, knowledge to performance. So we want to think about what we're doing, our community of practice as educators around this uh, issue of how are we going to build an online degree program, and we continue to iterate around the cycle. So our first cohort will be admitted in fall of 2021. Uh, it takes a lot of time to build up. It takes a lot of time to get to that place. And then once you run the first set of, of, um, of courses, as you know, there's always bumps and bruises along the way. And so we have built in a process that once we run it, we will improve it and look at it again and, and try to sort of tweak it if we need to add more explanatory videos. We'll just see what the content um, is. And then the other thing that it unfortunately takes is when you have all of these expert partners, um, it does take funds. And so again, we were, um, we were very uh, lucky to have the benefit of, of internal external funding, if you will, will, from our Center for Academic Innovation. Next slide. We wanted to pause here because uh, we know that we kind of went through a lot of information. We feel like we're speaking to our people, though, because when you say, uh, you know, digital and healthcare and uh, change and improvement, uh, we know we're in the right spot. So we are happy to pause and answer any questions or provide any clarifications, uh, anything you all need. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Gretchen and Karen. And so now's the time, folks who are participating today, to pop your question into the chat window, turn on your cameras, um, unmute yourself if you want to put up your hand to ask a question. And um, let's see what this has turned up for people. But maybe if I can kick off host privilege, I, I have a question about the human infrastructure behind the marvelous curriculum design. How approximately how many people are you would are in what you would call your teaching team? And what are the things you do to build this shared culture? And, um, it, you know, so that you communicate consistently across all of the ex encounters that your students have with you? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think as probably many of you know, that's not an easy task. Um, so we, in terms of people, <clears throat> we have a faculty in our department of, a, of about uh, 20 to 25 uh, people with primary appointments in our department. And everyone or almost everyone is involved with the Hills program. Um, there are, most of them are teaching at least something or mentoring students. Uh, so there is this ongoing, you know, narrative that we create around the need for um, the different parts of the cycle to continuously come together. Uh, so that at the end of the day, we are training the more of a holistic student rather than someone who is, you know, a, a, just a guru in informatics or a guru in implementation. You know, they're, they're coming out of the program really as a learning health scientist or, or some, some people call themselves health infrastructuralists, if that's even a word. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chuck Friedman thinks that it is, um, but uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's sort of, you know, it, within, within the program, you know, we have a obviously typical admissions committee, curriculum committee, um, uh, a qualifying exam committee, and now with, the, with Hills Online, we have a learning design committee as well uh, that works solely on, on the online degree. Fantastic. So I yeah, I'd love to get to the shared culture piece. Um, so, because one of um, the things I really love is complex board um, and engagement. And so, we uh, one of the underlying tenets is that the faculty are the content experts, right? And so, um, we want to make sure that the faculty are engaged as we are deciding on the courses, uh, as we're deciding who is teaching. Uh, we started very early on with socializing. What does it mean to be an online uh, instructor? We have other faculty in the department who have also been successful in the online space or have experience in the online space. So we had that sort of uh, knowledge built in. Uh, but, but in addition to uh, making sure that we have lots of faculty input through a variety of committees, uh, as part of this process, the learning experience designers support the faculty one on one. Uh, I, as the director, have a weekly meeting with the experience design team overall so that we know what's happening. Uh, we also have meetings, um, we call them huddles, faculty huddles every couple of weeks so that I can hear about any bumps or uh, bruises that are occurring along the way. Uh, and those are really great because um, people share information with me that I wouldn't otherwise know and then I can work in the background with the leadership teams uh, for each uh, either academic innovation or, um, or uh, I design to smooth the road. So I would say engagement, transparency. We also have a faculty developer who um, is helping to uh, provide pedagogies or solutions or other ways of teaching online because, you know, uh, while we've all succeeded in the Zoom era uh, for teaching online, it's not been easy. Um, I noticed I was going to go to a question. if because I Yes, I think we can see quite a few questions coming up in the chat window. Now, let's start with Jim Buttery, who's asked, given how long it takes a project to go through the LHS, you mentioned most master's students choose part-time. What do you think is the optimal duration for part-time master's course? Yeah, so right now, the way the structure is built, you could do it all in a year, uh, but we, um, the part-time learners end up doing, you know, two courses each, we're on a semester-ish. Uh, so, you know, 14 week course, 14 week course, 14 week course. So they could do two at a time or three at a time plus electives. So, yeah, I wanted to jump in there. I wasn't sure um, whether, whether uh, Jim meant given how long a project takes like to go through the LHS cycle, um, 
what the optimal uh, time a student should be enrolled in the program would be. Uh, to answer, that's a, that's a good question, and I never really thought about it that way. Um, when students do their learning cycle projects, we, that's an eight week um, time period in the summer. And they by no means get, they get their way all the way around the cycle. Um, that eight weeks is a chance for them to dig in to one piece of the cycle um, to get just some applied experience. Uh, so it's not, you know, they're not um, embarking on a, on a huge project during that time. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered, I'm not sure if that was helpful. <laughs> Uh, if not, uh, please uh, put in the chat and, you know, uh, oh, Jim had to go, so he can't clarify. Okay, yeah. so well, we, maybe that's we, it. <laughs> we, have, um, we have a, several other questions backing up, but I just want to check whether you want to go back to your presentation before we take those, or you, which way would you like to proceed? Uh, so we came to the end of the presentation. We had a few extra slides, just in case, uh, people had questions. The one thing I did want to go back to was a comment that Karen made, uh, or the comments that when she answered her previous question about all of sort of the support that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and while we do have that for the online degree program, we don't have that for the residential programs. Um, and I think that that's very, very important. Um, I was involved when the residential program took off and I'm involved when the online programs taken off and it is much easier in my opinion to launch a residential program than it is to launch an online program. So, you know, it was, it was imperative that all of the support and transparency and huddles and came into play and and were implemented in order to in order to launch hills online yep point taken okay our next question is from mark budge and he's asking about the balance between asynchronous and synchronous contact mm -hmm. sessions how do you decide which components of the course are delivered in either form yeah it's a great question um the way i think about it is uh where do you need people power and engagement? Uh, so, you know, that joke on the internet right now, this could have been an email, right? <laughs> <laughs> if it could have been an email, you probably don't need to bring people in synchronously, but there is something to be said for creating community and identity and connectivity. Uh, and so, um, you know, as we technically are a hybrid program, the, our online degree, because we will be bringing uh, students to campus uh, for in-person engagement. And those in-person sessions will actually, uh, they'll be on the higher order of Bloom's taxonomy. So they'll be about applied um, and uh, applied learning, uh, connectivity with other students in the program, connectivity with faculty mentors. Uh, you know, you've probably been able to tell that Gretchen and I are, are pretty social people. And so we like to connect uh, with individuals as well. So that, that's really the discerning factor. You know, we also think about time of day, day of the week, when you would have someone come in synchronously, um, making sure that you move days so that sometimes, you know, people can't always be on a Thursday. Uh, so that, that's really how we make that decision. Yeah. Great. Now, um, Allison Johnson is asking a question about articulation between the master's program and the PhD program. In other words, is the master's program the same as the first year of the PhD? And can you start and transfer smoothly on? Yes. Uh, so we, we designed Hills from the get-go so that the master students were taking the same courses as the PhD students uh, and sitting in the same classes as the PhD students. Now, some there are pros and cons to that, obviously, um, but it has worked well and it has allowed us to establish sort of a path to PhD. Uh, so if someone 
wants to come in as a master's student and decides to stay, which I could say happens quite a bit, um, they have the ability to do that and their courses transfer over. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, now, we've got a question from Daniel Capuro about how connected or embedded your academic teaching team is with the hospital's electronic medical records teams. And he's saying most of the implementation projects might need modifications to the EMR and how do you actually get that done? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and we are very lucky to have folks on our faculty who um, spend a lot of time uh, working with our EHR system, which is EPIC. Um, and we even go so far as in the classes that we teach, we, we, uh, we give students in the one, um, the Intro to Health Informatics class, um, Alan Flynn, who's the instructor typically for that course, uh, he gives people sort of a sandbox to play in, um, a, you know, pretend sandbox. And we teach them how, we teach the students how to pull data, how to request data from the EHR, how to clean it, because chances are it's going to come, come to them pretty dirty. Um, so we're very, we're very embedded that way in terms of, of content that we're teaching. The other really good thing is that so many of our faculty from Hills and from the department do all of their own research using that EHR data. So they know who to go to, to access it, who to go to, to talk about changes that need to be made. So one of the one of the most common uh, learning health systems health problems of interest that we tend to work on is best practice alerts. Um, physicians tend to hate them, but uh, LHS people tend to love them. And, uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, it, it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of um, a lot of contact, a lot of going back and forth with those folks. Yeah, and yeah. We're lucky enough to have those people. Super, thanks. Now, um, Cecily Gilbert has a question that follows on from this, and I'm going to leverage on her question. So she's asking how you incorporate perspectives and priorities that come from industry and balance that with the academic theoretical perspective. And, and also, if I can ask how you, um, how you are thinking to demonstrate to industry that you are having the impact that the learning health system claims it can have. Yeah. Um, so we have actually two of our current uh, PhD students. Um, one, one woman works for Beringer Ingelheim and the other woman uh, just, just left uh, IBM Watson. And they were actually instrumental in, in getting us to understand what industry is looking for and um, the, the pace at which industry moves compared mm -hmm. to the pace, as you know, that we move <laughs> in academia mm -hmm. um, or even in, even in the government. Um, so that has been instrumental and, mm -hmm. and we, tend to try to incorporate uh, those types of examples and, and, you know, projects into the courses that we're teaching. I think that we, you know, all of the courses that we have, we do a pretty good job of coming at it from a very applied nature, less theory, um, less, you know, typical academic, Although we have some, we, um, we really rely heavily on an applied experience. Mm -hmm. And then Kathleen, to your question, remind me again, it was... Around what, what, in what ways do you demonstrate that this is having impact actually? Yeah, um, that's, I mean, that's a good question. And I think that 
we are, so our department and Dr. Friedman, who's our chair, um, you know, he is developing sort of close relationships with um, insur payers, insurers. Um, we don't necessarily do a lot of pharmaceutical work, um, but he has many, many connections. He and, and Alan Flynn and uh, Tim Pletcher, another faculty member with um, industry around, you know, knowledge and knowledge transformation and guidelines and, you know, that, that type of, um, and, that type I, of area. Yeah, and I also think that um, it depends on the community of practice and the project, right? So um, if the interest is, so one of our PhD uh, learners is very, uh, he's in, actually works in our operating rooms at the University of Michigan. And so his work is centered around what we consider never events, right, as a surgeon, which is leaving uh, instruments or other things in the body cavity and not accounting for counts, right? Um, and so you can, uh, you can make a direct link to uh, his data collection, his, inter you know, his uh, uh, interventions, and then a quick, a quick show of hands of how, how quickly our left in cavity stuff went down. Um, during the COVID, uh, the height of our COVID, uh, our first height, um, sorry, we're in Michigan, but um, one of our colleagues uh, looked at how can we predict who's gonna need an ICU bed or who's gonna, who's, who will predict uh, who needs a ventilator. So those quick cycles, uh, um, you know, do have return on investment for the system. Mm, mm. Thank you. Now, um, in the time that's remaining, I think we've got time for just two more questions. So I'm going to um, pose one from Don Chu and then one from Wendy Chapman. So Don, I'll choose your second question, which is around what process did you and your team go through to understand the profile of the students that you were building this master's program for? How did you know that if you built it, they would come? Yeah, so uh, we pro just like you would do any business ende endeavor, we prototyped personas. Uh, we did a market study to see, are there any other types of degrees out there like this? Um, one of the things I did not talk about at all was all of our marketing efforts and our purposeful use of uh, social media and uh, um, you know, uh, keyword, you know, optimization, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, just like any startup company, that's what we did. <laughs> yep. Uh, and we also, we also learned from the residential master's students mm -hmm. um, and what their personas were. And that was able to, mm -hmm. you know, let us know what we at least thought um, the online master's students would look like. And I think above all else, what we see is that students who are interested in this degree are not your traditional student. They're not right out of undergrad. Um, they, have, they have worked a little bit, um, a lot of them in a healthcare setting, and they've seen the problems that happen in hospitals, in healthcare organizations, even in like, foundations, uh, you know, health foundations, things like that. And they're looking for solutions to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, I think that's the biggest characteristic. Yep. Thank you. Wonderful. And the last question from Wendy Chapman um, is around what is the informatics component of the learning health systems learning experience. How do you think about the, the traditions that many of you have been trained in and this new concept of what we're about? Tell us more about the informatics in your curriculum. Yeah, so like I said, we offer a intro to informatics course, um, but we also offer courses in data science. So that's where students are learning R, they are learning to code. 
um, you know, they are learning to analyze data, to visualize data. Um, we also have uh, courses in natural language processing, um, you know, where students are learning to, you know, take take those words out of the EHR or other other, you know, data systems, um, and analyze that. Oh, Wendy, clarification: What is taught in the informatics methods? Oh, I see. Um, you know, in the intro to informatics course, Wendy, we it's it's a survey course and it's very lecture based um off the top of my head i would have to look at alan's um syllabus to yeah. actually go through the topics and i could certainly share that with you uh send it to you interestingly for hills online alan will be teaching a um an informatics for learning health systems course I think which will be really, really awesome. And he's going to be using um, a ton of different uh, 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 examples of, of databases. I know Karen knows more about his online course. Yeah, so it's really about data structure, uh, data, um, so structure, representation, uh, different ways of uh, getting data, storing data, cleaning data, um, from the informatics piece, uh, um, I think he's going to be looking at standards and uh, really just a big a high survey course. What we're hoping is that we create this arc through the degree program that will, um, and we're going to be purposeful about that to make sure that, that, that we reinforce um, the informatics piece as we move forward. So that's why we'll layer on learning analytics and we'll layer on natural language processing. Um, Etc. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Karen and Gretchen, so much for setting aside the time to talk with us today. It's wonderful from a personal perspective to be able to have this level of discussion with educational practitioners. I'm sure many people have given more thought to learning health systems and how to learn about them that, as a result of your presentation, uh, which is terrific for all of us. Thank you so much again. And for everyone else who's participated, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget that the recording of this session is available on our YouTube channel. And our next seminar coming up in two weeks time on the 29th of April is with Yunhee Jung from the University <laughs> of Sydney. And if the focus there is on patient and public involvement in digital health, involving the public in research in the digital age. So thank you again, everyone, for your time today. Stay safe, stay well. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.